Now let me introduce a concept called the trace of an operator. Trace of an operator. X. Symbolically it is written as such. And the definition is the sum of the diagonal elements of its matrix representation. Therefore, notice that I have used the so-called old basis. We always have a set of observables. If they are non incompatible, no matter, they have two different complete orthonormal eigenvector bases. Therefore, I have chosen the eigenvectors of the A observable. And here is, its matrix representation would be A, K, say, A, I, X, A, K, any general one. And the diagonal ones corresponds replacing this with the K and summing over the diagonal elements. So that's the definition of the trace of a, a operator X. Claim or lemma, whichever language you use. Trace is independent of the representation. A very important theorem. So simple and innocent, but extremely important. So let me demonstrate that. Well, this is in the A representation. How do I go from the A representation to the B representation? So a trace of x. You introduce here two completeness sums. which is an identity, right, in terms of the B. So I insert the B completeness. I started with the old basis, the trace in the A representation, insert the B completeness. So what do I get? Sorry, I have to use a different set of dummy indices, obviously, because K is already used. So it will be sum over K and L, A, K, B, L. B, L, X, X, uh, two of them, okay, K, L, M. Well, please don't get misled. I don't mean to insert the same exactly here or here. One in, in completeness sum with the dummy index L, another completeness sum with another dummy index M, and then original summation K. So altogether it looks complicated, as if there are three sums in this trace X. But notice that there are some things that I can use, some nice tricks. These are complex numbers, right? All, therefore, I can freely move them anywhere I like. If I move this here, what do I have? So notice that there is a, a K summation. So let me leave the L and M summation out. And let me insert, uh, move the K summation in and write it as BM AK and AK BL. K summation concerns this contraction, L and M still, still staying. So then I have BL, X, BM. So move this in. Perhaps I should do it with different colors, sorry. What is it? It's the completeness sum of the A basis. So this is one, right? So one, it is one, 
dropped BMBL, used the orthonormality of the B bases, that is delta LM. So this entire thing is delta LM. If it is delta LM, I can carry out the L summation, and it becomes only M BM X BM. And then you can compare these two expressions. And this one. What is it? It is the same trace of X. In first version, it's written in the A basis. Diagonal element of the matrix representation in the A basis. And diagonal element sum, of course. Diagonal elements of the uh, x, the same operator in the b basis, they are equal. That's a very powerful theorem. Trace is a, such an important concept in many fields of physics, therefore, that you can prove the independence of it, the representation independence of it, so trivially, essentially, in a few minutes is very gratifying, really. So let me list further properties of the trace. What are the further properties? Let me list them and then let's demonstrate them one by one. For, for instance, for any operator, X and Y are any operators. That is, there is no, the, compatibility between them. They do not commute. But they commute under the trace. That's the first property. The, the proof will be very easy. Let me list and then let me uh, then demonstrate. Second, trace of u dagger x u is the same as trace of x. Meaning, change of basis. In some way, it is equivalent to this, right? Because when you are changing the basis, you are transforming x goes to u dagger x u in the operator language. This is in the matrix language, that's in the operator language. Again, the proof is almost trivial. I will go through it for half a minute each. The third property is a little more involved. It is the following. Trace of AI, AJ, this strange operator. Notice that it's not a projection operator. It's not the same indices A and I and J. But this is just an operator. So the trace of it is delta IJ. And trace B I A J for B I A J is A J B I. Okay, demonstrations. Essentially, the first one is the crucial relationship. That is, when x and y are arbitrary operators, which do not commute, but under the uh, trace sign, they do commute. So what, how do I demonstrate? Let me start by demonstrating the first one. What is trace of x, y? Let's choose the A basis, for instance. Sum over i, a, i, x, y, a, i. That's the definition. Then. Insert here a completeness sum a k a j rather it's not utilized. <clears throat> then there's some j summation. 
So it is equal to i and j, a i x a j, a j y a i. What did I obtain? Numbers and numbers. Numbers can be shuffled freely. Then rewrite it as, you may say, is this so trivial? Yes. Things are so trivial once you know how to handle them. So ij summation again. aj, y, ai, ai, x, aj. <coughs> Numbers shuffled freely. And then I moved the i summation in here. Use the completeness sum as 1. And get j, aj, y, x, aj, finished, which is nothing but trace of yx. Beautiful, isn't it? So that's the uh, crucial theorem. Once that is understood, trace of xy is the same as trace of yx, that is under the trace operation, the any operator commute, then I can use this to demonstrate the Second one, quickly. Now let me call this V. Name, just a name. Trace VU is the same as trace UV. Therefore, the, to demonstrate the second one, trace of VU. V is defined as this U dagger X. Let me use the notation that I defined this gave it a name, to be able to use the first theorem. So this is equal to trace of uv. Then write what v is explicitly. Trace of u, v was u dagger x. Okay. Then use the unitarity of the u. Trace x. Trace u dagger x u is trace of x. u is unitary, of course, that's to be understood. Here, qualification. u is unitary. If this is for the unitary class, I might have similarity class, of course. Instead, I could call it s inverse xs, which are the similarity class. That's, it's more trivial. Because S inverse moves and S S inverse becomes one, so it is again the trace is invariant under unitary transformations, under similarity transformations, and the third and fourth are not too difficult to demonstrate. Let me demonstrate trace A I A J. Again, use the same basis; it's ideal. So it is sum over K. A K A I A J A K. Let me move so that you can see. I have used the A basis here. This inside is sandwich between A K and A K. That's the diagonal element summed. Use the, the, the orthonormality of the A basis delta J K delta. This one is delta ki, this one is delta jk, carry out the k summation delta ij. So simple. And lastly, again, sub, I will write underneath, although it's a bad corner. So trace biaj. You are free to use any basis now. I will use the A basis. I invite you to do the same for the B basis and demonstrate that it's the same. As traces are basis representation independent, you are free to choose any basis. For the A basis, I write this as sum over k, a k, b i, a j, a k. Right here, 
This is the operator I start with. I sandwich them between the A bases and take the diagonal elements K and K. And AJ, AK is delta JK, converts the sum K, drop the sum K, set it equal to J. AJ, BI, as required. This was an operator, trace is a number, indeed came out to be. This was an operator, trace is a number, indeed just one, delta IJ. And this is one and one, it is one, one and zero, it's not, the trace is zero. So that completes the, the trace demonstrations. Now I move to so-called diagonalization issue, which was an important issue. Well, we have two operators. It has a complete orthonormal basis. This has a complete orthonormal basis. <coughs> Suppose matrix representation of B in basis A I is known. That is A I B A J. This matrix, this table is known. Question. How to find the eigenvalues and eigenkets of the operator? No. Eigenvectors and eigenvalues of B. These set of numbers are known. I would like to define uh, the eigenvalue problem of the B and determine its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Sort of the reverse problem of the previous ones. This sort of means uh, instead of two bases being known and finding matrix representing two bases, we say we have we know the first bases and we know the matrix representation of B in here. And I would like to determine these, really. Part of it's part, you know, we go ahead and determine part of the missing parts, actually. So what do we do? We are interested in solving the following problem, right? That is the problem to be solved. Determine these and these to be determined. In a sense, perhaps this picture is a bit I'm trying to determine this portion. You see? This is known, and its eigenvectors are known. B is given, and its representation in that is known, and I would like to solve the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the B. That's a, a better schematic representation of the problem. So what do we do? What we do is take this equation 
and project this along AJ, both sides. So what do I get if I do so? AJ, B, AI, sorry, BI, is equal to BI, AJ, BI. Okay. That's a mixed representation, so therefore let me reduce it to uh, as what I know is this. I would like to make this known quantity to appear in here. How do I do that? I insert here a completeness sum. Okay, so K, AJ, B, AK, AK, BI, BI, AJ, BI. Notice that there are certain things that you recognize, right? But this has the following form. Let me symbolically indicate what it looks like first. That is the known matrix representation here. Indeed, I managed to make it appear. So K is the e, dummy index summed over, indeed, the matrix multiplication rule. So here is a square matrix which has the e, JK, and here is the K, and put the I as a spectator index up there. That's a column. That's a number, this number with the spectator index again. And this one is a column, J spectator index I. Indeed, it's this table, this schematic picture, reflects that matrix equation properly. J is free, which is free. So it is retained here and there. And Ks are summed over indeed, matrix multiplication rule. So the position is correct. This, the square matrix is to stay on the left, column on the right. The square times a column is a column. Indeed, you get a column. I plays the role of a spectator. Change for changing values of I, you get a different equation. And all the rest are consistent with the matrix multiplication rules. OK. So I, can, I will introduce a notation called AKBI CK put the spectator index up as I have done there. Also replace the BI not so because it's a spectator is not manipulated so I will change this notation to B sub I. Then the equation looks what? The equation looks like B minus lambda i times c, a column vector, a square times a column vector, <coughs> equals zero. That's a column vector. So if, I, if you allow me, that's a very, very funny exotic notation to <laughs> indicate that it's a column vector. I, I put that funny sign on it. It doesn't have anything to do with the Euclidean or Cartesian vectors. Eh? That's just reflecting the sequence. <coughs> to get a non-trivial solution to this homogeneous linear equation, the, there is one condition to be satisfied. The determinant of this should be equal to zero. This is the so-called secular equation, right? And lambdas are the eigenvalues of the B.
B matrix. What are the lambdas? These are the Bs, right? These Bi's, lambdas, Bi's. Okay. Notice further that the CKs, which I define in here, the first index is K. What are those? They are the U matrix, right? The matrix representation of the U. Let me write that matrix representation of the U. What are these? A, say, C, K, I is A, K, B, I. What is B, I? U times A, I. A K U A I Then be really determined, right? The 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 what was the question we started with? Matrix representation of the cap this B operator is known in the old basis. What are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors? <coughs> eigenvectors EKI, are related to the uh, matrix representation of the transformation operator in the old basis. in A basis. As E, e I are spectator fixed, K is the free one. So what happens when you look at this U matrix here? This is the K index running here counting the rows <coughs> and I index is the columns but for given I I have for given I for instance here this I given I K changes and I have a column matrix of the U that's an important thing. Those of you who know the diagonalization problem realize that the eigenvectors of the B are the column matrices of the U transformation operator. Okay. What was U? U was changing U. U, U was the operator which changes you from the old basis and the new basis. New basis for the B is its eigenvector basis, and it's diagonal in that in that basis, isn't it? If I look at the B in its own eigenvector basis, what do I get? B I B B J is B I B I B J delta I J. So bi delta ij. In a sense, by determining the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the B matrix, I am finding the basis which is diagonalizing it. In a sense, indirectly, I am determining the by eigen if I determine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, I am also determining the U matrix 
U matrix is the diagonalizing matrix. So this is a matrix diagonalization problem. As I said, one of the most profound mathematics which enters into the definition in many places of physics. Okay. Perhaps, uh, although it, is, was, it was more or less clear from the notation that we have used, instead of x's or y's, we use a and b, which is reserved for the Hermitian operators. And a and b, which appears in our discussion in here, are Hermitian operators. And the hermeticity property of the operators in here is crucial. Hermitic property of the A is crucial because we need this complete orthonormal, orthonormal basis to start with. And it's well known that only Hermitian operators, well, it's not the only, Hermitian operators are known to have complete orthonormal eigenvector bases. That's important. The B, in, for which I am trying to determine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, in this context, is also sub, should also be Hermitian. Otherwise, some of the features which enter in here wouldn't be obtained. Perhaps I should mention a counterexample to demonstrate what I am talking about, really. Well, when you would like to resort to a simple example, it's always understood that it should be a spin one-half problem. In the spin one-half case, for instance, we have seen previously that there is an example. Example, why we require to have B to be Hermitian. If you read general abstract mathematics books, when they uh, discuss the diagonalization problem, they say let's have uh, let's start e either with Hermitian operators or normal operators to make it more general. If they are not normal, you cannot talk about uh, diagonalization through these procedures. Okay, so here is this simple example. <laughs> what was? What are the usual bases that we look? It is the so-called SD bases which we denote to be with this notation. That's a two-dimensional vector space and plus c and minus c form a complete orthonormal set. And then we may wish to know the S plus operator that is the so-called A, that's the so-called B, and S plus we know its representation in the Z basis. What was it? It was this, right? Zero, one, zero, zero. So it fits into the wording of the previous theorem. Here is a operator B whose matrix representation in this basis is known. Can I determine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this? That is, can I find a basis which diagonalizes S plus? That's really the problem, right, actually. Well, first of all, notice that the very nature of the S plus is very alarming. It's not Hermitian. Not Hermitian. What do I mean? Well, S plus dagger is S minus, which is different than S plus. It's not Hermitian. Therefore, let me force to find whether I can uh, determine its eigenvalue problem. So what do I do? I look at this secular equation in order to have a non-trivial eigenvectors. 
or that non-trivial eigenvectors will, for, will form the columns of the diagonalizing <laughs> U transformation. And can I solve this equation? Well, let me try to solve it. What is it? It is, let me put an H bar in here so that I, I get rid of that H bar. So, zero minus lambda. One, zero minus lambda. Determinant of this should be equal to zero. Lambda squared is equal to zero. Lambda one and two is equal to zero. What is the lesson I get from this? What are the eigenvalue equation for this? It's zero something. So C doesn't exist. A non-trivial C doesn't exist. So a non-trivial U diagonalizing transformation doesn't exist, you see? Because it was in her mission. It, it was bound to fail and this is an explicit demonstration. I wish I could give you a more rigorous operator theory proof, but here, let's not get into this. We do physics a la Feynman or Fermi like this. You see this counterexample shows that when you uh, you don't have a Hermitian operator, then the theorem doesn't go through as, as shouldn't. So hermeticity of the B is crucial here. Let me talk about unitary equivalence before turning my attention to continuous spectrum. Spectra, really, not spectrum. Okay. Unitary <coughs> equivalence, you may say. What? Well, let me explain. Let me do the following. Consider given AI and BI given, complete orthonormal. Suppose they are related via U, unitary. That's already discussed, right? We know it quite well. can determine u from here. We have seen how to determine it. AIBI, AIBJ, sorry, the matrix elements are. So if we, so u, u known, and this is associated with the A operator, and that's associated with the B operator. We will reserve, you know, these eigen, complete autonormal eigenvectors are associated with these Hermitian operators or observables. That's you known because I can I know how to determine it. So I would like to question the relationship of the A, which is associated with this complete orthonormal basis, and A prime, which is defined as U A U inverse. We will try to understand the relationship, but if so, these A and A prime are said, are called, are said to be unitarily equivalent observables. I don't know which one is the proper English, unitary or unitary equivalent or unitarily equivalent. I would have tend to say unitarily equivalent, but let me use the book's language. Unitary equivalent observables.
You notice that I'm still with the A and transform A. But U is connecting the A eigenvector and B eigenvector bases. There is sort of some interminglement. Let's elaborate a little bit concerning this interminglement of these things. Okay. Let me now start A, AI, 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 right? That is the definition of eigenvectors of the A operator. Let me act on it by the operator U. U is the change of basis transformation thing. U A A I A I U A I. Well, I would like to form that. So let me insert using different color an identity in here. There are different ways of inserting identity. And this time I will use this identity insertion. Uh, then I see these eigenvec these sort of transformed eigenvectors, which are Bs, right? That's how these are related. Remember, that was the way we constructed the unitary transformation U connecting any member of the basis, old basis and the new basis. So these are bi, bi, and this is a prime, right? U, a, u inverse, bi, a, i, bi. Now compare this against the following the other equation, that equation defining the B, 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 compare against looks very much the same, but not exactly, right? Because notice that here eigenvalues are the same as the old eigenvalues, this one. So eigenvalue spectrum of the unitarily equivalent ones are the same. But eigenvectors are different and they seem to be related to the eigenvectors of the B operator. So that's the how sort of intermingled plays a role. But one thing is clear. Looking at these two equations, which we define to be unitarily equivalent. So how do I, what do I say about them? Well, I cannot say much about them, but what about the following? Focus on these two relations. The relationship of A to A, the transformed, the so-called simply A prime, and b to a prime. Notice that a prime is closer to the b in the spread because they have the same eigenvectors, right? I wish I had a third color that having the same eigenvectors, forget the eigenvalues. Here they have the same eigenvalues, but eigenvectors are different. Therefore, having simultaneous eigenvectors means they are compatible. 
They can be diagonalized together. This has the common eigenvalue, so it's the same. It doesn't mean much here. Have common eigenvectors. Can be diagonalized simultaneously. Why? Because this basis, in this B basis, both B and A inverse are diagonalized. Let me write it. Although it's such a trivial statement, can be diagonalized together. How? That's how. B, I, B, B, J from this equation is B, I, delta, I, J. And from this equation, again, B, I, U, A, U inverse, B, J is A, I, delta, I, J. They are both diagonal. In the first case, the diagonal elements are b1, b2, b3, etc. In the second case, diagonal elements are a1, a2, a3, etc. But they are diagonalized, that's the point. So this unitary equivalence is quite an interesting game and it can have several <coughs> interesting applications. And for example, he gives uh, uh, example, uh, simple example again from the spin one half problem, Sx and Sz, they are not simultaneously diagonalizable, right? They're, they're not diagonalized together. But you can write Sx in terms of the Sz through a finite pi over two rotation about the y-axis. In that sense, they are unitarily equivalent. What is the unitarily equivalent? Sx and that transformed thing. I leave it as a private homework again to enjoy yourselves. Think of it. Sx and Sc in this context. And how do, they, how do you relate them via this uh, type of unitary transformations? And what do you say about their unitary equivalence and simultaneous diagonalization? So that, uh, let's, uh, I think it's a good point to finish this operator formalism, matrix representations, change of bases, change of representations in the discrete language when we had discrete spectra. Now we are going to move to a new subject which is going to be continuous spectra problems and we will consider the position and momentum operators after the break.